Our next speaker uh, hit lead off uh, for the conference, Father Cassian Folsom, and he spoke to us, opening up to us the scriptures, or excuse me, the fathers of the church, looking at uh, St. Cyril, St. John Chrysostom, Augustine, and Leo the Great, uh, taking us through some of their catechesis and looking at the transfiguration in light of the spiritual gems of the fathers of the church. Uh, this morning, he will speak to us about post-communion prayers and the transfiguration. So, Father Cassian, welcome back, and thank you very much for your talk. I confess, I do not deny, but I confess that I'm technologically challenged and I don't have audiovisual aids for you or digital aids for you, but uh, paper aids. So there should be a handout on your, on your tables that will be uh, uh, necessary for following this talk. The orations of the Roman Missal, what we call eucology, to use a technical term, these orations uh, refer to the transforming effects of the Eucharist over and over again. But they do this by means of code, code words, which are sometimes explicit, uh, sometimes implicit. In this lecture, I'd like to provide you with the tools to decode the message. The message is extraordinary, namely that the Eucharist not only transforms those who receive it, but divinizes them. There's a connection here with the patristic text we examined earlier, because the eucological tradition of the Roman liturgy was strongly influenced by St. Leo the Great. You recall the magnificent phrase about the effects of the Eucharist in Leo's Sermon 63, where he said, the participation in the body and blood of Christ accomplishes nothing less than this, that we cross over into that which we have received. In Leo's theology, this transformation depends entirely on correct Christology, or in other words, an orthodox theology of the Incarnation. Let me attempt a systematic presentation of that, of that theology here so that when we look at selected orations, which are not so systematic, we'll be able to understand them more easily. In Leo's teaching, the Chalcedonian teaching, the word of the Father becomes flesh in such a way that the two natures of Christ, divine and human, are perfect, perfectly united in the one hypostasis or substance of his divine person. God's purpose on taking on human nature is to allow man to take on the divine nature, to become divinized. This is the admirabile commercium, the wonderful exchange that the liturgy proclaims. Because of our common human nature with Christ, we are joined to him, and being joined to him who is God and man, we participate also in his divine nature. Tertullian says that the, the, the flesh is the hinge of salvation, Cardo, uh, caro cardi salutis, that is, uh, we uh, are joined to the flesh of Christ by his human nature, which turns uh, like a, the hinge of a door over to the divine nature. How does this divinization come about? By means of baptism and the Eucharist. By baptism, we become members of the body of Christ. We're still looking at St. Leo's theology here. Uh, the body of the one reborn, he says, becomes the flesh of the crucified. Becoming the flesh of Christ, we are united also to his divine nature. The same thing occurs in the Eucharist. We receive the body of Christ, indeed we become the body of Christ, and being joined to his human nature, we participate also in his divine nature. This concept is simply a development of the teaching in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, in which the greatest gift of God is described as becoming partakers in the divine nature. 
In Leo's language, the key words describing this divinization are particeps and consors. Christ is a particeps in our human nature, a participant in our human nature, and we are participes or consortes, sharers in his divine nature. These words or their derivatives are used constantly in the Mass orations. They are important code words. So when you encounter them, pay special attention. There are other less frequently used words that describe the same dynamic, such as transire, to cross over, or transfere, to transfer or to become, to change into, and transformare. One possible approach to examine the effects of the Eucharist in the orations of the Roman Missal would be, to, would be to do a word study of this specific vocabulary. That would be very fruitful, but in an oral presentation like this, it would be very tedious. Therefore, I'd like to take a liturgical approach instead, presenting selected orations describing the divinizing effect of the Eucharist according to the unfolding of the liturgical year. Christmas, Easter, the Ascension, Corpus Christi, Per Annum, uh, and concluding with the Feast of the Transfiguration. And as a way of limiting the material, I have chosen for the most part orations that are found both in the 1962 and in the 1970 Missals. Uh, let me explain how the handout works, uh, which we will be referring to. There are selected orations uh, given here. First of all, there's the Latin text. Then in italics under the Latin text, where the text is to be found in these two missals, the source of the text in the tradition, and then an English translation, uh, a literal translation of my own, so that we can uh, understand more the specific vocabulary that's being used. So without further ado, let's begin with uh, one of the Christmas orations, which says, Deus, qui humane substantiae dignitatem, et mirabiliter condidisti, et mirabilius reformasti, et et means both and. Da quesumus nobis eius divinitatis esse consortes, qui humanitatis nostre fieri dignatus es particeps. You notice in bold the words divinitatis, consortes, particeps. The translation is this, O God, who wondrously fashioned the dignity of the human substance and more wondrously reformed it, grant us, we beseech you, to be partakers of the divinity of him who deigned to become a participant of our humanity. And you notice uh, the source of this oration uh, in the italics above is the Veronense sacramentary by way of the Gregorian sacramentary. I'll explain that in a moment. This oration, probably composed by St. Leo the Great, is perhaps the clearest example of the divinizing theology we're describing in this lecture. The prayer comes from the most ancient collection of Roman orations that we possess, the so-called Veronense Sacramentary, which dates from the late 500s. The oration is present also in the Gregorian Sacramentary from the early 600s, but was not carried over into the later tradition because in the Gregorian Sacramentary, this prayer was hidden in a list of optional prayers for the Christmas season. So uh, its place as a Christmas oration uh, was not carried on in the tradition. The Missal of 1970 recovered this gem of the tradition and placed it as the collect for Christmas Day. The oration did survive, however, in the medieval tradition as a variant used as a private prayer of the priest at the moment of mingling the water and the wine during the offertory rite. You see this on your handout as variant A. Notice that in the 1970 Missal, 
variant, variant B, prayer was truncated, but the part describing the, divina, the divinizing effects of the Eucharist is still present. So let's examine the theology of this oration uh, using the, the text, the, the first text, uh, right after the word Christmas underlined. The prayer begins with a very simple invocation, Deus, followed by what we call a qui clause, a anamnesis that is describing what God has done for us in the past. Notice the very positive anthropology. God created the dignity of the human substance in a marvelous way. And he redeemed that same, in human, that same human substance in an even more marvelous way. You might recall St. Leo's clarion call in a Christmas sermon, Agnose o Christiane dignitatem tuam. Recognize, O Christian, your dignity. Uh, St. Leo has a very exalted view of human, of human nature. In this prayer, creation and redemption are placed side by side. The petition of the oration, starting with da quesumus, is more complex because it includes another anamnesis, another meditation on God's mighty deeds. How was this redemption brought about? By the incarnation. The Son of God deigned to become a particeps, Look at the end of the prayer. Dignatus es particeps. He deigned to become a participant of our human nature. The petition of the prayer is very bold. Since Christ is now a partaker of human nature, we ask to become consortes, sharers, or participants in his divine nature. Divinitatis esse consortes. Note that the two code words are used in the same oration, consortes and particeps. This is the heart of the Christian message, expressed in a prayer which is raised to God precisely in the context of the Eucharist. It's not a post-communion prayer, which usually describes the effects of Holy Communion that we have received. It's not even a prayer over the gifts, which often describes the hoped-for effects of the Eucharist, but it's a collect, which lays out the big picture and summarizes the theology of the feast. The Eucharist, as a divinizing agent, is only implicit here. It will become explicit in other orations. Let's pass on to the second example from the Easter season. Deus qui nos per hoios sacrifici veneranda commercia, unius sumeque divinitatis participes efficisti, notice the words in bold, presa quesumus ut sicut tuam coniovimus veritatem, sic eam dignis moribus asequamur. O God, who by means of the venerable exchange, the awe-inspiring exchange of this sacrifice, have made us partakers of the one and highest divinity, the code word of participes there, grant we beseech you that just as we have come to know your truth, so we may carry it out by a worthy manner of life. The source is the uh, Gelasian sacramentary by way of the supplement to the Gregorian sacramentary. This oration in the ancient Roman sacramentaries was used both during the Easter season and in the Peranum season. In the Novus Ordo, as you can see by the italics there, the Missale Romanum of 1970, it's used six times during the Easter season. Notice that the concept of the commercium, the wonderful exchange in this oration, refers not so much to the Incarnation as to the Passion of Christ. The context is a secret, or superoblata, which concludes the offertory rite. Let's look at the, at the prayer itself. 
The invocation of God, once again, is extremely simple, just Deus. The anamnesis contains the theological dynamic we're looking for. God has made us partakers, or participes, of his unique and most high divinity, divinitatis participes. How did this happen? By the veneranda commercia, the awe-inspiring exchange of this sacrifice. Which sacrifice? That of the Eucharist in the first place, hoyus sacrificii, which we are about to offer. It's a superoblata. Notice the anticipatory language here, which the post-Vatican II reformers disliked so much. The sacrifice of the Eucharist is being spoken about as a reality before the Eucharistic prayer, before the consecration. Obviously, the liturgical texts have no problem with such a theological anticipation. How is this sacrifice of the Eucharist an awe-inspiring exchange, a venedanda commercia? In the sacramental economy, the body of Christ on the cross and the body of Christ on the altar are the same. In this same body of Christ, the transaction of this wonderful exchange is carried out. He takes our humanity, we receive his divinity. In this oration, the petition looks forward to the effects of the Eucharist in Christian life. In the second part of the prayer, since we have come to know his truth, we pray for the grace to put it into practice by a worthy way of life. Usually an expression like tuam veritatem refers to orthodox Christology. Thus, soteriology, how we are saved, and Christology, who Christ is, are intimately linked. We can only be saved if Christ is who he says he is and who the church's dogmatic definitions proclaim him to be. Our human nature can't be saved if it hasn't been assumed by the only begotten Son of God. There's a second oration on your handout for the Easter season at the bottom of the page, beginning ab omni, and the bold uh, print word is transferat, to transfer or change into. The same prayer is found in both the 1962 Missal and the 1970 Missal with this difference. The oration in the Tridentine Missal was directed to Christ, whereas the 1970 version is addressed to the Father. And I'll say more about that in a moment. Let's look at the, at the text. Ab omni nos quesumus domine vetustate purgatos Sacramenti tui veneranda perceptio in novam transfera creaturam. May the awe-inspiring reception of your sacrament, we beseech you, O Lord, change us, purified from all oldness, change us into a new creation. The context is a post-communion prayer, and as we might expect, the oration describes the effects of the Eucharist. The scriptural allusion is to St. Paul. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The Easter orations often play on the contrast between oldness and newness, referring implicitly to the effect of baptism. The use of this prayer during the octave of Easter reinforces this baptismal interpretation. That is, the reception of communion by the newly baptized is described in reverential terms, veneranda perceptio, a reception which inspires awe. Thus, having been purified of the old man in baptism, the new Christians pray that the reception of the awe-inspiring Eucharist might have a divinizing effect, that is, that it might change them into or cause them to become a new creation. I'd like to make a brief excursus, uh, a detective story, really, about the doxology. The most ancient version of this prayer 
You notice um, in the very last line on that first page, the source is the Veronense. This ancient version doesn't say sacramenti tui, your sacrament, but simply sacramenti. The prayer in the ancient sacramentary is addressed to the Father, and the doxology begins with the word per, per dominum, which is to say, through our Lord Jesus Christ. The prayer addressed to God, the Father, through Jesus Christ. That's in the most ancient layer of the Veronense. The next layer of the tradition is the Gregorian sacramentary, and the prayer here has inserted the word tui sacramenti, your sacrament, which could mean the Father's sacrament, but could also lend itself to a Christological interpretation. That is to say, the prayer becomes somewhat ambiguous. In any case, in this level of the tradition, the doxology begins with the word per, again, through our Lord Jesus Christ, so the prayer is still addressed to the Father. Now, one of the earliest printed missals, that of 1474, changes the doxology, I suspect using a 13th century source, and now the doxology begins with the word qui, you who live and reign with the Father, that is, the prayer is addressed to Christ. The Missal of Pius V, 1570, repeats this variant. Now the doxology is even more explicit, beginning with the words, qui vivis, you who live and reign. It's true that the majority of orations in the eucological tradition are addressed to the Father, that's an ancient liturgical norm, but every now and then there's an exception. The post-Vatican II reformers wanted to eliminate the exceptions and therefore corrected the Tridentine wording of this prayer to return to the doxology which it had in the ancient sacramentaries. In the 1970 Missal, therefore, the prayer is once again addressed to God the Father, clarifying any possible ambiguity by adding the words, your son, the sacrament of your son. So the prayer now reads, May the awe-inspiring reception of the sacrament of your Son change us into a new creation. Through all these textual variations, the transforming effect of the Eucharist remains the same. Turn to page 2, if you haven't already, and let's look at a preface for the Ascension. For the Feast of the Ascension, we have a preface from the Gregorian Sacramentary, but inspired by a more ancient text, a longer preface containing language reminiscent of the sermons of St. Leo. It's fair to affirm that the text of this preface, as it has come down to us in the Missals of Pius V and Paul VI, is inspired by St. Leo the Great. Let's look at the text. The VD means vere dignum et justum est. It's just the formula for the preface. Uh, it is truly right and just to give you uh, thanks through Christ, who, qui, post resurrectionem suam, omnibus discipuli suis manifestus apparuit, et ipsis cernentibus est elevatus in celum, ut nos divinitatis sue tribueret esse participes. It is truly right and just to give you thanks through Christ our Lord, who, after his resurrection, appeared openly to all his disciples, and while they were looking on, he was taken up to heaven. Why? So that he might grant us to be partakers of his divinity. The preface uses phrases taken from the Acts of the Apostles to describe the ascension of Christ into heaven. The unique element of the preface, however, is the explanation of the purpose of the ascension. And here the theme of the wonderful exchange, the admirabile commercium, can be discerned in the background. The longer preface from the Veronense sacramentary says, Christ deigned to become man in such a way as to grant that we might be partakers of his divine nature. That has St. Leo written all over it. 
The code words there are divinitatis participes. In this case, the divinization of the Christian is not described as an effect of the Eucharist per se, but as a result of Christ's redemption in general, brought to completion by his ascension into heaven. Corpus Christi. The feast of Corpus Christi makes a very clear link between the Incarnation, the Passion, and the Eucharist. That is, the body of Christ born of Mary, the body of Christ on the cross, and the body of Christ in the Eucharist are all one. In the liturgy, these connections are made by subtle allusions. On Corpus Christi, the Christmas chant melodies and Christmas doxologies are used for the day hours of the Divine Office. And in the Usus Antiquior, the Christmas preface is used for the Mass of Corpus Christi. Further, devotional hymns such as the Ave Verum Corpus make a clear connection between the earthly body of Christ and the Eucharistic body of Christ. You remember how that hymn goes, Ave Verum Corpus Natum Ex Maria Virgine. But it's addressed, the, the hymn is addressed to the body of Christ in the Eucharist, uh, and speaking of it as a born of the Virgin Mary. The Feast of Corpus Christi was instituted for the Diocese of Liege in 1246 and extended to the Universal Church by Pope Urban IV in 1264. The liturgical texts for the feast were composed by St. Thomas Aquinas between the years 1259 and 1265. It's not surprising, therefore, that the 13th century sacramentaries or missals that contain this feast include it as an appendix added by a second hand at the end of the manuscript. This is how the prayer reads. Fac nos quesmus domine, divinitatis tue, sempiterna fruitione repleri quam preziosi corporis et sanguinis tui, temporalis perceptio prefigurat. The prayer is addressed to Christ, qui vivis, you who live and reign. Make us, we beseech you, O Lord, to be filled with the everlasting enjoyment of your divinity, which the reception in time of your precious body and blood prefigures. This oration is a post-communion a post prayer which contrasts the sacramental reception of the Eucharist in time with the enjoyment of the divinity in eternity. The one prefigures the other and the Eucharist communicates a foretaste of the reality. The use of the word fruor as opposed to utor is significant. In Christian Latin, fruor or in this case the noun fruitio, refers not to the earthly enjoyment of secondary goods, but to heavenly delight in primary goods, the good itself, which is God. So this post-communion prayer speaks of the ultimate effect of the Eucharist, which is the enjoyment of the divinity in heaven. We now turn to the per annum cycle, the time throughout the year, in particular the Sundays after Pentecost. In these examples, the oration is not tied to any particular feast, but speaks of the, spir the daily spiritual life of the Christian. The first example, Concede Nobis Omnipotens Deus, is found only in the Missal of 1970. It's a new composition, a post-communion prayer citing St. Leo's Sermon 63 almost verbatim. I've included it here because we examined this important sermon in the last lecture, and you'll recognize the language immediately. Concede nobis omnipotens Deus, ut Dei percepti sacramentis, inebriemur atque pascamur, that's directly from St. Leo, Quatenos in id quod sumimus transiamus, so that we might cross over into that which we receive. 
You'll recall that in Sermon 63, Leo is speaking about the change that takes place in the person who receives the Eucharist, a change which he calls commutatio. The effects of the Eucharist include a profound transformation of the moral life of the recipient, but not only. The change is so dramatic that we are changed into, cross over into, that which we have received. There is a change in being. In other words, we become the body of Christ. This oration, however, is, as I say, is a new composition, simply citing St. Leo almost word for word. The second example uh, is from the ancient classical tradition. The oration is taken from the Roman sacramentaries, the Gelasian sacramentary by way of the supplement to the Gregorian sacramentary. The key word here is not uh, transire, as we saw before, transiamos, but transfere, uh, as you see in bold. But both words have a similar meaning. Here's the oration. Oblatio nos domine, tuo nomine dicata purifice, et de die in diem, a celestis vitae transferat actionem. May the oblation dedicated to your name, O Lord, purify us, and day by day change our behavior to that of a heavenly life. The effects of the Eucharist in this post-communion prayer do not manifest themselves all at once, but gradually, almost imperceptibly, the Eucharist purifies our behavior, our actio, and brings about a change so that the worldly way of life we used to lead gradually gives way, de die in diem, to a spiritual or heavenly way of life. This oration is more realistic, perhaps, than others we have examined. The divinization, which is the effect of the Eucharist, does indeed take place, but it requires time. This kind of conversion is not sudden, but gradual. The last oration we'll examine is found in the 1970 Missal only. It's a new composition, the post-communion prayer for the Feast of the Transfiguration. I've included it here because it corresponds more explicitly to the theme of this conference, Transfiguration in the Eucharist. Here's the text. Celestia quesumus domine alimenta, quesumsimus, in eius nos transformant imaginem, coius claritatem, gloriosa transfiguratione, manifestare voluisti. May the heavenly nourishment which we have received, O Lord, transform us into the image of him whose splendor you wish to manifest by means of his glorious transfiguration. The code word here is transformare, an even more explicit word, action word, than transire or transfere. The heavenly nourishment, which is the Eucharist, transforms us. But this transformation takes place only through the mediation of Christ. Christ is the image or icon of the invisible God, according to Colossians chapter 1, and we ask to be transformed or changed into that image. In eus imaginem transformant. In a certain sense, we become an image of the image. This language seems less direct than that of other examples we've considered, in which the Eucharist makes us partakers, it seems almost immediately, of the divinity. Here, in, on the other hand, we become an image of Christ, the image. There's an important aspect here which helps us to, uh, to enrich our understanding of this dynamic. Even when divinized, or even divinized gradually, day by day, the scripture affirms that no one can see God and live. We need the humanity of Christ in order to approach the consuming fire of God. Thus we're transformed into the image 
of Christ the image. We see his glory, but it's a glory adapted, so to speak, to our capacity to receive it. Having examined eight selected orations, we're now in a position to summarize our results. The Eucharist divinizes. How so? By means of the incarnation, which is brought to completion, of course, in our Lord's Passion and Resurrection and Ascension, Christ takes on our humanity, humanitatis participes, we become partakers of his divinity, divinitatis consortes. We've seen various examples of this. This is a wondrous exchange, an admirabile commercium, or in the plural, veneranda commercia. The description of the Eucharist, of the effects of the Eucharist in these terms, is very frequent. But the question remains, how does this happen? By baptism, of course, and by the Eucharist. And what does the Eucharist do? Well, the reception of the sacrament changes us into a new creation. And by this reception, we cross over into that which we have received. The reception of the body and blood of Christ prefigures and anticipates our ultimate enjoyment of the divinity. And the exchange, the commercia, of the Eucharist's Eucharistic sacrifice causes us to participate in the divinity. The oblation of the Eucharist changes our way of life. The heavenly nourishment of the Eucharist transforms us into the image of Christ. These affirmations are quite extraordinary. The Eucharist divinizes. The gift of God is beyond measure, beyond reckoning. It's our task simply to receive the gift and recognize its value. As the Lord says in the Psalms, open wide your mouth and I will fill it. Thank you so much, Father Cassian. I, I believe when you enter the glories of heaven, Leo the Great will be there to meet you. <laughs> exactly. And one of the things that he'll say is, thank you for teaching so many people that Christ, you know, divinizes us, transforms us. And that, in fact, it's not just Leo the Great, but uh, the liturgy of the church uh, wants us to absorb this rich truth through prayers at Christmas, Easter, the Ascension, Corpus Christi, Per Annum, and Transfiguration. Throughout the whole year, you have shown that the Church really takes seriously the fact that Jesus Christ is present in the Eucharist, and that we receive the Eucharist, and we are changed by what we receive. So thank you for inviting us into that life-giving truth. One of the ways that this divinization takes place that Father reminded us is through the baptism and, of course, in the Eucharist, and that there is also a, a moral change and a change of way of our being, being, which was highlighted in the prayers per annum. And so we definitely join you in our joint, ask that you, your community pray for us, that this may be a reality that even more so than your community's ability to change water and grain into phenomenal beer, that the prayers of the church will change us very deeply into Christ. Um, those of you who, who aren't familiar, uh, the monks of Norcia have a brewery, and they have a very fine, fine brewery in the Belgian tradition. And it's uh, a great gift for a lot of people because it gives them a chance to talk about how wonderful God is in sustaining our, our bodies as well with the gift of uh, the creative genius of the monks. But above all, Father Cassian, I, I just want to speak, you know, very from the heart, I suppose. I just, I just really appreciate who you are. You know, I just, I just really am deeply moved by your love for the fathers and uh, your love for the Eucharist and the way that you have committed your life to the church and, and to the Lord and studied the course and a real pioneer in uh, the reform of the church and the monastic life and in a profound witness of faith in, in the Lord, faith and the transformative effects of the grace of Christ in our lives. So 
uh, with all sincerity and the deepest humility, we just want to say thank you.